very quickly after Columbus's first voyage, uh, the Spanish return, or uh, the Spanish explorers return to the, new, uh, to the old world and report to Spain their findings. Um, and it becomes um, eminently clear almost from the beginning uh, by European standards, there is something worthy of further exploration. Um, and uh, this causes a little bit of a problem just because the Spanish aren't the only uh, Europeans who are pushing out of Europe um, at this time. The Portuguese had actually been doing so for um, at least half a century at this point. Uh, Portugal is this little corner of the Iberian Peninsula and the Portuguese have been um, sailing down the west coast of Africa to various islands here called the Atlantic Islands, all the way around Cape Horn to India, and then to the islands of the Indian Ocean. So places such as uh, modern day Indonesia, Sumatra, Singapore, Malaysia, um, going all the way up to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so the, the Portuguese have a very um, proprietary attitude about global exploration and news of Columbus reaching a landmass by traveling west is going to set up a lot of tension between the Spanish and the Portuguese about who has the right of global exploration. Now, of course, nobody consults the people who live in these regions about whether they want to be uh, explored in the name of various uh, Christian European monarchs. Um, and yet it is pretty obvious that the Europeans have the tools and the capacity to make that exploration and possibly after that, the development of trade routes and the development of colonies that will increase uh, European monarchs power, their sphere of influence and uh, the, the, uh, the um, spread of Catholic Christianity um, become very apparent. So in 1494, a mere two years after Columbus's first exploration, we have this document here. Um, and here's a copy of it uh, that is property of the uh, National Library of Portugal in Lisbon. I don't speak Portuguese or read Portuguese, but these cognates are all pretty obvious. This is called uh, the Treaty of Tordesilla. And the Treaty of Tordesilla uh, was uh, created by the Pope as a compromise between those in Spain and those in Portugal who are looking to spread the influence of their monarch to new corners of the globe, whatever those corners might be, whether they are Asia, whether there's something completely new, um, is, uh, is uh, up to question. Uh, so the, the Pope basically splits the known world or he takes it upon himself to have the right to split the known world between the Spanish and the Portuguese, basically giving the Portuguese the right to continue exploring the uh, Eastern hemisphere. So basically they will sail South and East out of their homeland and whatever they hit, they can explore. They can attempt to colonize and trade with in the name of the Portuguese King. And then the Spanish, the right to go west and whatever land masses they hit in sailing west, they retain the same privileges. So uh, why do we uh, need to know about this? Because it tells us a couple very important things. The first thing it tells us is that it becomes very obvious even after this first voyage that there is something out there to the west that is worthy of exploration by European standards, uh, by exploration and the things that come with uh, exploration, which at this point could be the development of colonies, the development of trade routes, the exploitation of trade, and the spreading of Christianity. Uh, the second thing that it makes really obvious is that Europeans are already on the move. I uh, believe I spoke about this being the foothills or really kind of well into what we might call the age of European agitation, uh, which precedes exploration and the real ability to explore using ocean going vessels, which is going to be the subject of our drill down session this week. The Europeans are looking to bust out of their parameters. They're looking to 
uh, find new resources for their benchmarks of wealth and value. And they are most certainly looking for new Christians, as uh, we talked about with last week's drill down. So the Treaty of Tordesillas uh, fits very clearly into those impulses. So then the question becomes for us, what exactly is going to happen in the Spanish New World and how is it going to happen and how is it desired that it happens? Uh, as I referred to in the last lecture, many of us are probably familiar with a book by, by a scholar named Jared Diamond called Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, which is really meant to be uh, kind of a, an oral evocation of the, the Spanish shorthand plan for the New World, which was gold, glory, and God. Uh, so the spreading of Catholic Christianity, um, uh, gold, uh, which is obvious, uh, the acquisition of riches, and one that might be a little more puzzling to us, and that one is glory. So why glory? What did the Spanish mean by glory? Well, the, uh, the two images that I'm showing you on this slide are illustrative uh, a bit of that concept. It goes to who the Spanish send to the New World. And they send a certain type of person uh, known as a conquistador. Whoops, I'm not sure what happened there. Huh. Sorry. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> it even has the whoops. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, <laughs> it's very, actually very funny to see all of my own words. Okay, I'm going to get that off there. So let's stop that. Okay. I clearly had to play around with that a little bit more. Thanks for abiding with that, folks. The person of the conquistador. Uh, I will explain to you what precisely a conquistador was and why they matter so much to our story of early America. So we were talking about the uh, first people that the Spanish sent to the New World to represent them. And really it's a question of who is willing to go. Uh, basically no one in the 1500s traveled to places for a, a sense of adventure. There was always some sort of very tangible payoff at the end. Um, indeed, you'd be silly to just travel for adventure's sake because it was actually far too expensive and far too dangerous. So that raises the question, who is willing to seek glory and feel glory is an important enough reason to uh, put your very existence on the line to make this dangerous Atlantic crossing uh, and to land in this region where you know uh, the people living there um, can either uh, be you know, interested and inviting to you or they can be hostile to you. And it attracts a certain person that the Spanish, so it's called in Spanish, the conquistador. And who are these conquistadors? Conquistadors. Well, basically, they are the younger sons of Spanish noblemen. Um, the Spanish nobility had been basically impoverished by almost eight centuries of nonstop warfare against Islam. And as a result of that, these families had a, a lot of a lot of pride in their prestige and in their aristocracy. They did not have a lot of money and they did not have family uh, fortunes um, left to speak of anymore. Much of that fortune had been kind of given to the Spanish monarch in the name of uh, reconquering the Iberian Peninsula in the name of Spanish Catholic Christianity. So uh what happens um when the new world uh becomes an an obvious method for potentially making riches uh the first conquistadors are really the sons of these noble spanish houses usually the younger sons 
of the Spaniards. And they are going to come to the New World to hopefully restore family fortunes. And here we see a little uh, potential image of this. And this image was drawn by, uh, this man may not look like a conquistador to you, but he was. Um, his name was Juan Garrido. And Juan Garrido, Garrido was uh, an artist of the first generation of Spanish conquest. And what is he showing here? A Spanish nobleman uh, taking some sort of valuable gift that's being uh, given to him, perhaps in some form of exchange or with some promise of protection uh, to uh, the native people that he's encountering. Uh, these would actually be people in uh, Mexico, um, the indigenous Mexica uh, or Aztec people, or uh, one of these groups that pays tribute to the Aztecs. So uh, Garrido drew many of these images and it's thanks to his artwork that we have these little uh, glimmerings of what these encounters look like. I also wanted to point out the fact to you that uh, Garrido is a man of color. And part of our story this semester is that uh, we're going to, many of us are going to come to these topics with the idea that uh, racism and bias based on skin color is a natural human state. And what we uncover when we look at the history of the early Americas, uh, the United States and the other Americas as well, is that that was not necessarily a given, that status is an incredibly important thing, who your family is, what your family's line of business are, are they noble, are they gentry, are they aristocratic? Uh, we're going to see some images at the end of this PowerPoint that might upend our idea of racial bias and taboos against racial mixing. As we can see from Juan Guerrero here, uh, he was of African origin, but somewhere along the line, his uh, family became not only um, Christian and uh, Spanish in, their, in, in at least part of their, their cultural outlook, but they became very, very wealthy. And he was a man like so many others, white, uh, and, and of color, um, predominantly white, but some men like Garrido of color, who make their fortunes in, their new in the new world. Uh, before we move on from the slide, there's just one really important idea I wanna get out about the conquistadors. And that is that they are young men who have spent their entire lives since tiny childhood, um, hearing about enemies and the glory of crushing them. And specifically, this is geared toward talking about how the Muslims have been uh, sent out of the Iberian Peninsula, often very uh, ruthlessly in a very ruthless form of conquest, um, how uh, Jewish Iberian um, residents have been forced to adopt Catholic Christianity, and what can possibly happen to them if they don't do it sincerely, which was uh, at very least um, humiliation and shaming, and it could be murder, publicly sanctioned murder. So these are young men who are almost um, ideally primed to deal with the new world's challenges. They will take what they can get, and they will often do it with great ruthlessness. If anyone stands in their way, they are likewise well prepared to deal with conflict ruthlessly and brutally. It becomes part of a story of Spanish conquest uh, that we'll discuss in a couple of slides called the Leyenda Negra or the Black Legend of Spanish Conquest. Sorry, I didn't realize that once you wrote something down, it stayed permanently on there. So let me erase this. Oh, this is so easier, so much easier when you're in person and in a blackboard, but we do what we can do this semester, right? Thanks for bearing with me, folks, and bearing with me as I learn how to uh, use these technologies properly. So why were the Spanish under the impression 
that they were going to find all of these exploitable and valuable things in the new world. Um, they are under that impression because they do. Almost from the very beginning, uh, short of the, the very first encounters that Columbus has with native people and describes them as, as um, naked and having few things of value, um, some fruit, some birds, uh, they start to encounter other peoples um, more in the uh, more on the mainland and in the interior of the Americas who have considerable wealth indeed and they have wealth in uh, metals and products that Europeans recognize mainly gold and silver and they do uh, wonderfully amazingly artistic things with these. As you can see from this image here, it is a human skull and that human skull has been very, very richly decorated with uh, something we call a blue stone called uh, lapis, which has been around um, since ancient Egypt and was uh, used um, uh, among the ancient Egypt Egyptians and was considered highly uh, valuable a kind of fused uh, glass called faience, which is very richly colored. Um, ornaments of, of gold and of silver and of minerals that Europeans very quickly recognize are things of value from their previous experience and that they very much want. So you combine conquistador ruthlessness with the fact that there are tremendous uh, riches among some of the most sophisticated um, and, and ambitious and hierarchical cultures in the New World. And you have this really toxic explosion of, of lust to gain these riches and very little to no consideration whatsoever of the people who previously had them um, and what they might be able might they what they might want to do to defend their ownership. This toxic combination of uh, greed of the early Spaniards in the New World combined with their desire for riches and their desire to force people both to conform to their um, uh, requirements for uh, really slavery, enslavement of native people, and conversion to Spanish Christianity results in uh, something that was called in its time the Leyenda Negra or the Black Legend. of Spanish colonization. Shown here are two images by uh, a Dutch artist by the name of Theodore de Bry. And Theodore de Bry is uh, showing some, some pretty heinous things that are happening in the New World. He is uh, showing non-compliant um, indigenous people, even though they might look European, and that's basically a kind of lack of knowledge of New World people by many Europeans who never leave Europe, um, that uh, lack of compliance equaled a, a gruesome and brutal death. So I, you know, apologize to anyone who's looking at these and really disturbed by them, and of course we should be, they do reflect uh, a, a pretty heinous ex historical past on these continents, um, but they show these non-compliant people uh, basically being hung and then roasted to death. Uh, we see a Spaniard here, and we know he's a Spaniard because of the clothes he's wearing, and he's uh, picking up a small child, and uh, what he is going to do is, is essentially murder that child by hitting its head with all of its force uh, against a hard surface. And then back here, we have more Europeans using clubs and using swords and a weapon called a halberd uh, to basically hunt native people down 
and to kill them for non-compliance to Spanish dictates. So anyone who resists Spanish incursions, anyone who will not give the Spanish information that they desire, anyone who will not, uh, who will not um, comply with Spanish demands or Spanish behaviors. So the Leyenda Negra goes, uh, basically could be subject to all of these, uh, this, this gruesome genocidal behavior. These things happened, and we know they happened. Uh, they were not routine occurrences, and there's a reason for that. It's not because the Spaniards had any great love or any great appreciation for the indigenous people of the Americas, but in some cases, they are unable to gain the upper hand in controlling those relationships. So that's point number one that kind of pushes back a little bit on the Leyenda Negra as being a consistent and overriding um, attitude of, of homicidal behavior toward Native people. Um, two other things. Uh, the Spaniards would love to enslave Native people and force them to work for them force them to find uh, precious metals um, and mineral materials, force them, force them to work on farms called encomiendas, where the Spanish might grow things that do not grow very well in the old world that could uh, grow very nicely in the new world and be valuable imports. Um, force them to uh, build architectural structures for them and go down into the silver mines of places like Potosí, in Mexico uh, and bring in those riches. So there is a desire for a living workforce that can be compelled. Uh, the arbitrary killing of that workforce is uh, not something that's really comparable with the Spanish vision of making uh, new world riches. Yet we know when the Spanish feel that they are challenged or pushed or uh, want to meet an objective and there are people standing in the way, they can deal with them very, very, very brutally indeed. What Debra is also documenting here is that uh, the Spanish can at times um, meet with, with gruesome ends of their own and that these gruesome ends um, can be the result of simple encounter or they can be the result of uh, Spanish New World greed, Spanish contempt for the sovereignty and for the individuality of Native people that results in their death. And this image here, and, and students have asked me before, do these really represent Native Americans? Um, because they don't look Native American. Um, the answer is yes, they do, but it's Native Americans out of the mind of Theodore de Bry. Uh, he never went to the New World, this was his idea of what Native people looked like, that they were all kind of bald and all old. Uh, it's, it's a lot of layers of, of complication of both his imagination and an interpretation of documentation that may not have come out precisely well. But what's happening here is uh, very telling in terms of the Indian response to New World Spanish hostilities. This Spaniard here, a conquistador, um, presumably is uh, tied up and he's being restrained and a liquid is being poured down his throat and that liquid is actually molten gold. So that's going to kill him obviously, but the subtext here is there's a great irony in his death, which is uh, you want gold so badly, eat it. Um, like, you know, you can, you consume it. Um, so here you are, here's all the gold you can take and we'll uh, deliver it to you in the most uh, convenient way we know how, which is pouring it down your throat. Uh, in the background here, we also see something that is um, decidedly gruesome as well. Uh, these are scenes of cannibalism, of the butchering, of uh, Spaniards who have been killed or in the process of being killed through shock or loss of blood, um, and then uh, their limbs being put on uh, what's called a bucan, and uh, that bucan roasting the flesh, and then the flesh being eaten. And there is authentic history here as well. Uh, Native people 
did use cannibalism as a form of intimidation of enemies, whether those enemies were Spanish or fellow Native Americans, as we talked about with the Chaco Canyon settlers a couple of weeks ago, um, that, that was a bona fide practice. And the archeological record really does bear that out. So we have this twisted, sordid, horrible history of the 16th century new world with the Spanish, or I should really say the first half, up until about 1560, where there is murder, there is cannibalism, there is uh, cultural repression, there is force, there is slavery, there is sexual violence. Uh, there's a whole raft of horrors, which has a surprising change as the 15th, uh, as the 1500s wear on. And that is where our presentation is going to end this week. But we're going to look at a few more things and consider a few more ideas before we get there. Sorry, folks, my screen seems to be frozen. Not sure why. Just bear with me, apologize for this. Not sure what's going on. Um, again, my apologies. I would just keep your eye out for when the slide changes or you see some movement and then you'll know that I have successfully uh, exited, out of, exited out of this and uh, moved on to the next screen. Try that. Once again, I, I apologize for this uh, absurd interlude here. What I'm going to try to do is move to another room of my house and see if uh, getting closer access to the internet might help out the situation. What you just heard there were the little patter of feet of my dog. As she faithfully ran down the stairs with me and is very eager to try to help me 
out of this situation and get this PowerPoint going again. Thank mm -hmm. you. 